So I'm Kritika Sudhakar. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Van Andel Institute, as Dr. Crandall was already saying. Um, so have you guys seen the building, the Van Andel Institute? Do you guys know what's, I mean, like it's just across GRCC in the, I don't know, the starting of the Boswick Avenue. Uh, it's 333 Boswick Avenue, in case you guys wanna see the building. Uh, we are very open to visitors. Uh, you could like kind of even ask, I don't know, your staff or faculty to take you on a science tour there in case they are okay with it. Uh, we are very welcome to visitors and we love um, showing and sharing what we do at the Van Andel Institute. And we are a nonprofit biomedical research institute and we focus on most of the human health aspects like obesity, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and cancers. So these are like our four major domains that we work on. Something that I work on is obesity. Um, and also I do work on fruit flies, Drosophila marinogaster. I don't know if you guys have seen or heard about fruit flies. Um, yes, no, yes. Mixed, okay. Uh, so also, could I like get an idea as to who my audience are? Like students, faculty, mixed. Students, I see. Okay, faculty, I see. No, no. Yeah, okay. Um, so just to reorganize my thoughts as to cater to the audience, right? I would be like, going into deep basic science and then I figure out that all of them are my faculties and colleagues and then I'm like, okay, that was probably too simplified. Uh, then I would like probably look like a clown in front of everybody. But since I do have students as well, so it's like a bridge between both. So I'll make sure to incorporate both the ends. Um, so with fruit flies, you can ask me like, you know they are flies, what are you gonna do with them, right? Um, interestingly, they do share approximately like 70% of the genes with us and are approximately like 80% of the disease genes with us. So it's very interesting to study disease aspects in fruit flies, right? Especially obesity and metabolic disorders, nutrition-based disorders, and also Alzheimer's and pa Parkinson's because of their tremendously valuable and highly networked nervous system, just like the humans. But just because you cannot directly work on humans, which is ethically and morally wrong on all various grounds of science, you do them on you know, model organisms like C. elegans, Drosophila, mice, hamsters, and different categories based on the labs that we do. So something that we do is the fruit flies, as you can see, the cycle, it's a male and a female fruit fly, which obviously the female lays an egg or the embryo once it's fertilized. And then they do go into three stages of larvae. And then they go into a pupal stage and then they become an adult. So this entire process could take anywhere between eight to 10 days, right? So this is very much similar to the butterflies where they are in a caterpillar stage, they become uh, in their cocoon stage and then they come out as a butterfly, which is like a complete metamorphosis from their caterpillar stage to this colorful, pretty butterflies. And you could think, you know, the fruit flies are not very colorful, what are you saying? They are very pretty in case if you look under the microscope. You know, they're very shiny and they have this dark brown color and the red color and with the eye they can be between any beige to maroon, it can have all different shades of eyes. So that's very pretty to look under a microscope. Also the name Drosophila melanogaster means Drosso is dew or something like a moist. And Phila is obviously love. And melano is melanin pigment or the pigmentation and gaster is the abdominal region or the gastrointestinal tract, right? So they do have this deep melanin pigment in their gastrointestinal tract. So that's literally their name translation, which is Drosophila melanogaster. 
So why we use it? Because especially their diet is very easy to manipulate. You can like add nutrients, remove nutrients in and out comfortably without disturbing their survival, right? It's not a life or death situation for the flies. So that's very easy in fruit flies. And also they do have a very well-known and readily available genetic tools. So if you want a wingless fly, a legless fly, a fly that cannot see, a fly that cannot walk, you can like do all sorts of stuff. So they do have very readily available genetic tools. And they are obviously relatively inexpensive and easy to maintain and not like mice, right? Where you need a vivarium, you need technical stuff, you need feed, you need a sterile environment. Flies are not that particular. And also their shorter lifespan, which is like 60 to 70 days as compared to, I would say, mice, which would take two to three years for you to reach that stage. So, and also it allows us to use repeated number of uh, experimentation rounds and n number of flies to study them. So these are like the advantages of why we use flies. So I do have a video in case, I don't know, I, I really thought of bringing flies, but I did not want GRCC to have flies flying around. I don't want that. So I was like, okay, let's probably put a video. I don't know if it's like clear enough, but... This is like an entire cycle that the flies do. They mate and then they lay an egg, right? This is a female that's laying an egg. And then you could see that's a male. So this is how much, how tiny it looks. And you see that the first instar larvae that is hatching out of the egg, it's pretty, you know, mobile immediately once it hatches. And then they start feeding in voraciously in their food. It could be banana or it could be any, you know, even like citrus fruits. And in our labs, we do have, you know, sugar yeast medium, agar medium, which they feed on. And then they feed voraciously, voraciously and then they grow bigger in size. The, now that's, this is like a third in star larvae, after which it becomes a pupa, right? At that stage, it does not move anymore. Anymore, Like now it's starting to turn into a pupa. Its mobility decreases. You can see their brothers and sisters or whatever already pupated. And they darken in color. And you can see the stuff that's happening inside too. And that's how it comes out. It emerges, or this is something that we call eclosion. So that's how they come out of their pupa. And you can see they're the wings like all stuck uh, because of the moisture that was in the pupa. So she's trying, the female, this is a female, so she's trying to like expand her wings and free her wings so she can start flying around in the wild. So that's pretty much um, their entire life cycle. So this could be anywhere between, in a natural, um, habitat, it could be like 40 days, right? But in the lab, they can very well survive between 70 to 90 days. It's because we care for them. Um, yeah. But they are grateful too, you know, they give us good results and stuff. Um, also, these like are kind of like the divas of our lab, you know, they are also like very small. They could like fit in the tip of your pens that you're having right now. And these small creatures can even make the most serious scientists go, wow, how did you just do that? So the flies are capable of shocking you and surprising you in all ways. So what can you study in flies is like basically everything. You can like study their wings, head, body, thorax, legs, wing shape, size, color. And also you can study housing a single fly, a group of flies, and then you can do population studies when you do them in cages, right? These are mostly on the social behavior and uh, population genetics and stuff like that. And then you can just, I don't know, but tease apart the flies into different organs like the gut, the CNS, which is the nervous system, the whole fly, the reproductive system, and all sorts of organs in the flies. They do have everything just like the humans, right? 
And also which stage can you study them in is again you can study them at their oocyte stage when they are an embryo which, which is, this is how they normally look under a microscope. They are very glossy and very pretty. And then you can study them at their larval stage, pupil stage and also at an adult stage. So which basically covers I think the entirety of Drosophila. So it's highly useful model organism, and these are all the research areas that the flies are beneficial. So um, some of this is, these two sections are something that I did during my graduate school or my PhD, more towards evolutionary biology and population level studies. But now at the Van Andel Institute, I do a lot of physiology and metabolism with high throughput techniques like RNA sequencing, triple quad mass spectrometry, and stuff like that. But if you ask how did you jump from like two different research areas to two other different research areas which are not even connected, right? One is ecology and evolution, and the other one is core physiology and metabolism because of the star of my work, which is diet and nutrition. So during my PhD also, I had diet and nutrition where I studied these. And now with diet and nutrition, I study these. So with a common background, you could always branch out into different fields of science. Also to give you a brief overview, during my PhD, I did protein restriction studies, right? In fly's food, I restricted their protein content, and I saw what happens to the adults and their offsprings. So also, it was a transgenerational study where I studied approximately 50 generations of fruit flies, treating them with different kinds of protein-restricted diets. But in my postdoc, my dietary intervention is sugar, and I study the effect only on the offspring and it's an intergenerational study. So I study only what happens between the mom and her offspring. So it's kind of just a one generation study where I dig deep into what are the events that happens or is changing the course of life for the offspring because of the mother's diet, right? Also you can imagine like this is a microscopic world of soap opera, right? you get to see flies dating, mating, and drama over food. And you will not believe that if I say that flies are picky eaters, just like some of us or most of us, they are highly picky eaters. They can definitely choose between what they want. So they are very good. Uh, they do have very good foraging choices, too. So that leads to other questions, right? Uh, like, what is their nervous system? What is it signaling? Why is it choosing one food over the other? What, how does it know to distinguish? So all of these are research questions that pop up when you start studying these flies. So as you know, with diet, we do have two major elements. One is the carbohydrates and proteins. And there are other trace elements like lipids, vitamins, and minerals. So something that I focus on is uh, carbohydrates and proteins. So because with nutrition and health, you do know that whatever nutrition that the father or the mother takes is going to affect directly or indirectly his or her offsprings. And it's not like for a short duration of time, it's for the entire duration of the offspring's life which is very crucial if you think about what my mom ate is going to define what I am, is like, you know, I don't even have a connection except for like this biological connection that I have. How do you even transfer those information? So this is very curious as to understand how it happens and why it happens. So I will not go into too much of uh, stuff like with what I did in my PhD, but I do want to give you a glimpse of what I did uh, with protein restriction, because with fruit flies, we do mate them, and then we do get their embryo, which is then put into a protein-restricted diet, which means I would have a controlled food that the flies normally develop on, right? And then I start to reduce gradually their protein content and see how well they do or how worse they do in each of the foods. And I would go and dig deep into why this was and why wasn't the other food that way and stuff like that.
So one of the key um, findings that we found out for the first time and we reported for the first time was you can see AL means it's like an ad libitum food, which is like the control food. The flies has everything that they want to have. Like it's abundant or rich in nutrition. It can have whatever it want. It wants. And then you have a series of protein restricted diets. So I reduce it in like 10%, 10% till it like for one tenth of the original concentration. So now you see this beautiful double, uh, you know, peak that happens with like a trough in the middle. So now this tells me that the flies forage very well in these diets and they do well in this. But something happens here that they are not really happy about. So this graph is the entire survival that happened from an embryo to an adult fly. So the embryo was put into a series of protein-restricted diets, and then they were allowed to develop on that. So they fed on that. They became all the three instars of larvae, and then they pupated, and then they closed, right? And then we measured how many eggs were put in and how many adult flies came out, which is kind of the pre-adult survivorship. So based on the food, we do see that there is differences in their survival, which is like the pre-adult survival. So this is how the graph fits in, as you can see. So the major findings from those um, work were that we did a bunch of phenotyping and assays that we treated with diet. We studied their food intake, we studied their body composition, their energy expenditure, their locomotion, their stress response, a bunch of stuff. And what we find out is that there is this optimum dosage or effect of the nutrition that you have. Anything that goes left or right is going to do something beneficial or harmful for you. So you always you need to find this optimum dosage. And with flies, we were able to find out the optimum dosage of protein concentration that they needed to do at par with consuming abundant food, right? So even with less nutrition, they could still do like the same amount of activity and live the same way, just like they do on the control food. Why do you want to like eat extra and give your body unnecessary trouble through to metabolize everything? And then that's going to release a lot of byproducts and that's going to result in cellular aging and that's going to reflect on your body. So it's like a very complex process that we try to, um, you know, break down. So in case of something that I do now, which I'll be talking briefly about um, to, through the rest of the presentation, is something that we do with sugar. So we do high glucose diets, low glucose diets, and medium glucose diets for the flies, and we see uh, what is the effect on the offspring? So the interesting part here is that we give the mothers these different glucose diets for 10 days, right? And then we collect offsprings or eggs from her. So what does this 10 days of different diets for of the mothers do to the offspring? So that's what uh, we are like studying in our lab. And why is it important is because maternal exposures around the time of pregnancy can influence the offspring's health and risk of disease, which is the Dohard hypothesis. And it's been very well proven, and it's a very conserved pathway um, across species. And when I present this always, I do have um, you know, men or guys or boys telling the girls, women or uh, girls, telling them, like, see, it's the mother's diet. And then I'm like, no, it's also the father's diet. But it's only the mother's diet that I am focusing on. That doesn't mean that the father's diet does not do anything to the offspring. They contribute equally to the offspring's development, right? So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And also, the early interventions during the prenatal period is going to lead to improved lifelong health. So the gap in knowledge and why we are doing this study is because we do not know what is the events that occur during early embryonic development. We know that something is happening, but what's happening? We don't know that. And also, how does it 
does this mother's nutritional state is going to triggering going to trigger this altered developmental trajectory or course of development of the offsprings. So that's what we are trying to study. And in the fruit flies, we do have these different stages, right? We do have the F0, which is the mom, which is the first generation. And then she gives rise to an embryo. And then there is embryonic development. There is larval phase. And then there is this adult fly, which is the F1 that comes out. So the phase that we target is this the hows and whens of what happens in the embryonic development. That's what we study. And the nutritional intervention that we do is sugar diets. So in this, you can see that we do give only a 10 day of different glucose diets to the mothers. So this is a mother. This is a female fly. This is a male fly. You can see that there is this deep darkened portion at the posterior end of the fly. So that's a male. And that's not here, that's a female, right? So that's how you could like identify males and females in flies. And then you made them, you get an embryo. And you study this embryo. And also you study these mothers, right? So you need, in order to understand what's the output, you need to understand what's the input. So we do study the both ends of the spectrum. So this is kind of like summarizing my entire research work at Van Andel. So as you can see, that there is this 10 day glucose diet and I do phenotype typically analyze or assess the mother, right? I do assess her weight, assess the fat content that she has immediately after eating. And then I also assay the same thing in her offsprings. But on the other spectrum, which is not the phenotyping, is all these omics and high-end throughput techniques that I was talking to you about. So I do collect the embryos from these moms, and I do an RNA sequencing, and we do metabolomic studies using the triple quad mass spectrometry core that we have at the institute, which is a high-end um, service for doing omics studies. And then we assess what's going inside the embryo. Um, so starting here are some of the results that we found and something that we will um, further analyze or assess into, right? So when I was giving this high glucose, um, as you can see, this LGD here is low glucose diet, MGD is medium glucose diet, HGD is high glucose diet, right? So you see their body weight. So all the black dots were at the beginning of the experiment. And then after 10 days of giving them different diets are all the pink dots, right? You do see increase in their body weight. But then that's consistent across all the treatments. Then you will be like, you know, it's consistent across all the treatments. What are you going to get out of this? That's when we assess the triglyceride levels in the flies. As you can see, the low glucose is here, medium glucose is here, and the high glucose fat level is three times higher than that of the low glucose or the medium glucose. So the moms that had just 10 days of high glucose diets exhibited obese-like phenotypes. So now the embryo that I get from this mom is just making me wonder what, what went, to it, went into that, right? So when we assess their offsprings, boom, nothing. So this is assessed at the same age as their moms. So right? So their moms were assayed at age 13, and they were also assayed at age 13. But when they were assayed at age 3, we did see differences in their fat level. But at age 13, no. Because all these flies were given the same diet irrespective of which mom they came from, right? So all of these were not exposed to any kind of diet. They were all kept in a controlled diet, which means that these offspring's diet did bring down or probably benefit the offspring's, right, irrespective of the mom's diet. So now when I used to present this result in our institute, we do have like a lot of scientific people there and they just love to bombard you with questions. Why did you not do this? Why did you not do that? All the time. But one such question that they asked was, you tried putting them 
um, in like a controlled diet, right? Irrespective of the mom's diet. But what happens if you crisscross all of their diets and do a complete mismatch, right? You take an offspring that came from a low glucose diet fed mother and put it in a low glucose, high glucose, and medium glucose. And you do it with all the uh, case scenarios too. What happens then? So in this, uh, we did do this uh, with the help of our summer intern, Macy, from GVSU. And we see that in case of the female offsprings, so these are the mother's diet, right? So they, the mother had different diets. And then their offsprings were put into low, medium, and high sugar diets. So now what you see is that there is no difference based on the mother's diet. So all these three are only different based on their mother's diet, but they were all given low glucose at their developing stage. So they are not different. And then you see the medium glucose, again they are not different. But the only difference you see is all these six points different from these three points. So what is different between these? So all these three points were fed high glucose diet at the offspring level, right? So they were also given a high glucose diet irrespective of the mom's diet. So when that was also given, high glucose diet did increase their triglyceride levels, which means that they were becoming more susceptible to obese-like phenotypes. So with this, we knew that the mom did transfer something to the fly that when it combines with the offspring's own diet environment, it's going to increase it or decrease it, right? So when we did the survival or the starvation resistance for these flies, because when you have food, the main parameter is like you starve, right? When you don't have food, you starve. Uh, that's one of a stress, stress response that these flies have. So you see at this point when we quantified, we see that the females that came from the low glucose fed mom and the high glucose fed mom did have a higher starvation resistance. So they were more resistant to periods of starvation, which means again the mom has transferred something to the offsprings to enable them to fare well in their environment when they come across a particular diet which is not suitable for them, right? They need time to find a particular diet that they want. But that period of time is when you would starve, right? So they need to be resistant for starvation. So we do see that they are resistant to starvation. And one other thing was the hatching assay. As you saw in the video, the larvae coming out of the egg, right? So that's the hatching. Um, and the time that it takes to, for that process is normally 20 hours, right? But at this point, you see that the, when these offsprings or these embryos are just hatching out of the egg and they've had no contact with any of the environment or food environment before, except for just being pushed out of the mother's body, you see that their hatching time of the low glucose offsprings is one hour early and the offsprings that came from the high glucose moms is one hour delayed. So this is the control and you see a one hour decrease here and a one hour increase here. So when there was no contact of the offspring to its environment, it was only the mom, how does this happen? So that's when we do different omic studies. And this is one of our metabolomic study that we did uh, with the mass spectrometry where we have pooled samples and we did have fertilized and unfertilized eggs from three different diets. And we see approximately 25 to 35% of differences based on the fertilized or the unfertilized parameter. And there is approximately 10% of differences that can be contributed by other factors like the age of the egg, right? So the age of the egg that we fixed for this experiment was three hours. So three hours since it's being pushed out of the mother's body is the time that we calculate. But interesting point with flies is that they are capable of withholding their eggs, 
with the development of the embryo going on inside the mom's body. So you think that the mom is pushing out a three year, three hour old egg, but the egg could be like a five hour old embryo. So these differences are contributed by parameters like those, while approximately five to six percent of the differences here is contributed by the diet themselves between the high, medium, and the low glucose diets. So something that we found in common was there is three metabolites that's being transferred from the mom inside the offsprings that's different when you compare the low glucose, high glucose, and the medium glucose. And these are the three metabolites that change. As you can see, these three metabolites consistently changes in the high glucose offsprings, the offsprings that came from high glucose fed moms. And in case of an unfertilized egg, which is a direction that we don't want to go because at an unfertilized point, you don't get anything beyond an unfertilized egg, right? But still, we do see changes of um, N-acetylarginine decreased in the low glucose and the high glucose offsprings. So that actually brings me to the summary of my presentation where we have seen that these high glucose diets increases the triglyceride levels in the F0 females, which is the moms, and then we do see a delayed hatching time with the F F1 offsprings and also an increased starvation resistance, which is also sex-based, right? So even though we do see some effect of metabolite levels in the pool samples that I showed you earlier, our main focus is to analyze single embryos, right? So now I do have experiments that, I've run, that I'm running. I do have 1,700 eggs in 1,700 tubes that I process over like 10 months. So that's something, the volume of um, studies that we do to find what's happening. So that is something that we are still waiting on and we intend to look. So that is like our future direction as to what we are going to do and how we are going to do that. So I think, yeah, that brings me to my thank you slide. And thank you very much for the opportunity and the attention. And I'm very open to take questions in case you guys have any. Um, so I'm like used to all sorts of questions. So feel free to ask any question. Where did you get your doctorate from? Um, I did my doctorate in India. Uh, I do have my bachelor's and bi master's in biochemistry and my PhD in biochemistry biotech from uh, Shastra University in India. Yep. I have a fruit fly question. Yes. So it, it better be fruitful, Dr. Khan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned that there's a 70% overlap of yeah. genes. Yeah. So you are doing this type of studies that you talked about. What other things are fruit flies used for in either at Van Andel or other places? What other kinds of research is done? Mm, in them? Van Andel, our lab is the only lab that works on fruit flies. And we study, I mean, I study maternal nutrition and obesity. Uh, one of the graduate students studies paternal part of uh, inheritance, and I do have two other graduate students who study um, autism and ALD. So all of them working in the same lab under like uh, with the same supervisor, but all of us do different stuff. Uh, but then at the Van Adel, there is just one uh, lab. But in case of fruit flies, you can um, like use them in diet restriction studies like I do, um, neurodegenerative studies and metabolic disorders um, and evolutionary studies, adaptation studies and inheritance studies, right? In, in almost everything. I had a quick question. Um, so do you have a hypothesis, or maybe you um, have um, come up with some explanations, maybe I missed it too as you were talking, but uh, on how, what's happening inside of the, the developing embryos to, yeah. to cause that to yes, happen? Yes, um, I think that was um, 
uh, something that I left um, purposefully. Uh, at the end of my slides, you did see uh, that I talked about metabolites, right, uh, on metabolomics that we do. We do suspect that the metabolites are the stuff that is being normally loaded inside the embryo by the uh, mother, right? So she does pack um, DNA, RNA, and DTPs, all the nucleotides, and metabolites. So anything that happens in the DNA or because of the nucleotides is probably genetic. That's something that you expect, right? But when this particular diet intervention was not affecting the mom's genes, how is it getting transferred to the offspring? So definitely it's not a genetic thing. So it's something that has to do with the metabolites or epigenetic changes that happens in the transfer. So something that we focus on is the metabolites and we do have, uh, like we've identified two, three metabolites um, like uh, SAM, S adenosyl methionine, and uh, something like um, ATPs and also kynorenine, which are some of the metabolites that we think are being loaded excessively in the offspring that came from a high glucose diet mother. So we are still, we have to find out why it's getting loaded and what does, what is like the consequences in the offspring, but these are some of the metabolites that's getting loaded. Questions, anybody? You can like even ask me how many years of school I did. That's something I get. How many years of school did you do? Oh, <laughs> um, in India, you do need a master's degree to do your PhD. So I would say nine. No, it's, it's nice nine years, not horrible nine years. <laughs> Any other questions, or are we all set? And I'm sure if you want to ask her a, a question privately, yeah. she'll she'll be around here. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause and thank, thank her you. for your time. Thank you very much.